How am I doing now? Great. Happy New Year. Oh, brother. Happy New Year. My goodness, I got to wake him up. You don't want me to wake you up, trust me. You know, I was very angry this morning. Someone lied to me. I don't like being lied to. Do you like being lied to? You know, I was very angry because I'm, I'm a nice guy. I stepped on the scale this morning. It lied, lied, lied. Very unkind, so I went and got the other scale, figuring that one was broken. First scale was nicer. I threw them both out because I figured it was a faulty scale from that company, same company, so I learned a few things. Then I went to, I did a weight thing today, and then I went and borrowed my wife's little cloth measures. I went and measured my belly. I had to tie two of her measuring things together so it would fit around. So I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, I'm going to lose weight, get better. She can't do anything about this. I'm stuck with this, but I can fix this. So uh, that's my New Year's resolution, if you really care to hear that. And uh, one other thing I wanted to brag on before I started and is uh, I ride with the cops. Everybody knows that I ride with the police, right? I mean, I put it all over Facebook because I, I try to promote the goodness of what the officers do, what the fire does, and what the EMS do. These people do incredible work in our community. And uh, there's officers here today who one officer I've done a foot pursuit with. It was hilarious. Hilarious. We could laugh about it all day. They tease them all the time. I won't mention names, Kenny, I promise. Uh, <laughs> and then there's another officer here who, uh, every time I go ride with him, he busts more drug people than I've ever... <laughs> it's just... It's, uh, how do you know? He just stopped at a drug house. So I said, okay, he'll pull up. And he'll stand there and say, why are you nervous? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you're sweating. <laughs> I don't know. And, and as he talks, they come clean and they pour it all out. And he just, it's amazing. These officers know their work. They work hard at it. And uh, last night I was with the K-9 officer. And if you saw that, uh, I rode with them. And uh, he insisted that I come in because there was burglars in a house. And we caught two burglars last night. And all the officers came in there, and I go in there, and they're all like this, all these guns. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. The only thing I can shoot off is my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they got two burglars yesterday. I mean, I brag on our officers, but they're phenomenal. We, we, we appreciate them and our fire. <clears throat> Let's have a quick prayer, please. Father God, you are awesome. Happy New Year to all the folks here, Lord, all the people here who are the church as they come to you, Father, to worship and pray and to look to you for answers, Father. I thank you that we glorify you in everything that is said this morning. In your name, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. All right, let's get to the point here. We're talking about the seven signs today. Now, first thing I want to get through to you is that, hey, I'm a pastor. I know you find it hard to believe. I look like goober most of the time, but I'm a pastor. I've been... Next month, February, uh, is my banner year for turning of age. I will be in ministry 39 years next month. Wow. And, no, 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 I'm not looking for clapping. And, and, and all my years of pastoring and ministering and evangelizing and being police chaplain, fire chaplain, and all these things I've been doing over all these years, do you know the hardest thing to do is I can't make you spiritual. I can't make you spiritual. Who's going to make you spiritual? You! I can't sit there and say, you're going to be spiritual. I can give you the tools. I can pray with you. I can study with you. I can take you through scripture. I can do all kinds of things. All my Bible degrees and all the things I've ever done to accomplish what I've done doesn't mean a thing. Because you know what? That piece of paper don't. I'm not going to be standing in line of judgment with my doctorate and my master's and all that and say, hey, here it is. That doesn't matter. It's a piece of paper. Nobody cares whether I graduated first or last in my class. Usually it was last, but who cares, right? All right? Point being is that I can't make you spiritual. I'm trying to make me more spiritual, but you know what? Ministers have to have the barometer so high. It's not easy. People come to me and say, you're so spiritual. I talk to my wife, you know? She'll straighten them out right away. 
Anyway, the point, I have to be fast today because my time was cut because we had to do the Lord's Supper, which is very important. It's a time of prayer and reflection as Pastor Sam went through things. It's very important. But the seven signs, I want you to get some, this is technically a seven-point sermon with seven-week series. This isn't just something I like to blow through the walls here. But we're going to go through it pretty quick today. Just know that there's a lot of depth to this. I expect you to get something out of this as far as something you don't usually think about. The whole idea of being up here to preach is get you to get something out of it. It's just not miracles. Uh, signs are miracles, but miracles aren't always signs. Just remember that. Signs usually point you to something. These signs are something that points you to realize that Christ was God. He was the Son of God. He was there. And it's going to give you a very unique meaning out of it. And I'm hoping to get that out of this today. So what I did is I, I gave you addresses for all these different signs, and then we did some brief scripture. So track with me, okay? Now remember, you can be spiritual if you're reading and praying and confessing before God. Look, if you've got sin in your life right now, you need to confess it. Don't even come in here. You confess it. Don't even take communion without confessing your sin. You don't deserve it, okay? You need to come clean with God. Confess yourself. You want to see an improvement in your life, other people's lives? Go with pals. Help with kids in the, in the community. Help them to grow and to learn and to strengthen their spiritual walk. That's what we're trying to do here. I'm no better than you. Look, I have sinned. I confess things. I have to go before God and say, you know what, Lord, I am so sorry. And uh, that's the point I want to make for one thing. Okay, let's go to the seven signs. I'll touch on them. Turning water into wine heals the nobleman's son, heals a lame man at the pool of Bethesda, feeds the 5,000, walks on water, stills the storm, heals the blind man from birth, and Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. The first one, if you're taking notes, I'm going to go fast, so bear with me. If I get to about quarter after someone, don't hesitate. Wave me down. People think I'm kidding. No, I don't want to go over on this, although that one light is blinding me. Um, first point we want to make here, turning water into wine. John chapter 2, 1 through 12, write that down. But we're going to just touch on a few verses. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Now, back in these days, a, a Jewish wedding could last a week to two weeks. It's not like today where you go there, you, you see the nuptials, you go to a thing, and you leave at 9 o'clock, you get out of here. We're done with you. It's not like that. You know, I, in fact, I got my daughter getting married in June. I'll be out there in Arizona doing her, officiating her wedding. I gave her her $3,000 limit on doing the wedding, and we're all set, okay? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. He said, fill the jars. Now, they had all these stone jars here, 30 gallons each. Do you know that in a Jewish wedding back in the day, if you ran out of wine or food, that was very embarrassing. Very embarrassing. Like sometimes the, the bride's family could sue the groom. I mean, it got crazy. I would have said do a prenup, but, you know, that doesn't work right now, okay? So the point was is they filled the jars with water. They filled them up to the brim. Jesus said, go ahead and do that. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And he said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. When people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the best wine until now. So turning the water into the wine, the first point here is Jesus is the source of life. Now the point I want to make here is, yeah, it's a miracle, water and wine. We all go, okay, yeah, he made water and wine. Whoopee. But track with me. Here's Christ. Here's the water. Here's the wine. Now, I called a winery as I was researching this many years ago, and then yesterday I even called a winery because I wanted to double track my stuff here. Do you know to take a, a tender, tender vine, beginning of a vine for grapes, from a vine to a grape that you can harvest takes, on the average, three to four years to take a grape that's ready for harvest to where it's Chardonnay, which is a white wine. It takes 90 days. For red wine, it takes three years. So think of this now. 
Christ is here, he's got water, and he's got wine. Wait a minute, though. Let's go back. Let's backpedal here. You're taking a tender twig for growing grapes, a vine, to being a grape, to being picked. You've got to figure Jesus converted that water to wine. He had to be the soil that grew the vines, the nutrients in the soil, the fertilizer, the sunshine that helped it to grow. He had to be the moisture, the water. He had to be the one to do the harvest. He had to do the one to make the wine, to ferment the wine, to get the wine there. It's, it's all a process, but that would take the average person here, I'm not giving you a temperance lecture, okay? But for a person to go into a restaurant, have a glass of wine, or at home on their table, from literal twig of a vine to a grape to being wine, it's anywhere from four to six years. And all that work in between, the harvesting, the, the, the taking care of the soil, the nurturing it, the protecting it from frost and from heat and making sure there's plenty of water, Jesus was the conduit. He did all that in two minutes. Made water to wine. So I don't want you to see the miracle. I want you to see the depth of that miracle that Jesus did. He literally did the whole process there. He was the sunshine, the heat, the harvest, the, the grape picker, the smasher, making it the wine. So Jesus was a source of life. When we grow vegetation, that's growing a life. A seed has to die to be born, you know, all that stuff. But the point is that nah, it wasn't just water to wine. It had to be grown, harvested, prepared, and done. I want to, is everybody get that point? The drive home, we got it, made the point. So the first point was turning water into wine. Jesus is the source of life. Number two, heals a noble man's son. Let me read those verses to you. Now I'm going just through the touching on verses. I'm not going through the whole thing. The, the page or, or the address was John 4, 46 to 54, but I'm reading this to you now. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word, and Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. The father knew that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live, and he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign Jesus did when he came from Judea to Galilee, healing the nobleman's son. Noble, in other words, this was royalty. This was royalty that came to Jesus. You know, it's funny because if I wanted to, I'm not saying that Trump is royalty or Obama's royalty, but it, can you imagine if I say, hey, I'm calling Obama today. I want to talk to him and tell him what I think about some of his ideas, you know? Do you think I'd get through to Obama today? <laughs> Do you think I'd get through to Trump today? Do you think I'd get through to Pastor Sal today? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, once he knows it's me, he might say, hey, we moved, you know? Um, the idea is that you can't always get to them, but they can get to you. This nobleman came to him. If, uh, can you imagine, you think if Obama wanted something from me, he'd find me? You think he'd come to me today? If he wanted something bad enough, sure he would. Well, the nobleman went to Christ. Now, Jesus is the master over distance. What I want to get out of this is, here's a sick child. Nobody likes to see a sick child. Nobody likes to see a kid die. I've been a medic since 76. I've been a medic. I've been a funeral director. I've been an embalmer. Uh, I've done so many things that are crazy in my life, but I had to make a living and support a family. Amen? Amen. Oh, don't be so excited. Amen? Amen? We take care of our people, right? So I did all these things over the years, but nobody likes to see a child die. Let's be honest. We've all, some of us, even experienced the pain of the death of a child. It's awful. Here's a nobleman of royalty coming to Christ and saying, look, my child is sick. He's going to die. I need you to come and fix him. 
Now, the problem here is the nobleman knows that Jesus did the wine and that miracle, but the nobleman's not coming to him as the Messiah. He's coming to him as a miracle worker, as someone who can do something for me. We get desperate at times, don't we? We get desperate. Hey, when you're in trouble, you got somebody trying to hurt you, who do you call? The cops. The cops get there pretty quick. What took you so long? Paramedics, when you got someone in cardiac arrest, you call the paramedics? Let me tell you, they're, they're breakneck speed to get to you. Minutes seem like hours, especially if you got a gun pointed at you or someone's beating on you, okay? Or if you got someone you love in cardiac arrest or having trouble breathing. It seems long. You know what? This man was so desperate, he implored Jesus. He said, please, I'm begging, I'm asking you. My son is sick. Come on, come to my home and heal him. And Jesus even said to him, look, you guys want signs, you want miracles. Here's a man who really couldn't care less. He just worried about his son. Hey, look, how many of you have ever had a sick kid? Raise your hand. How many of you have ever had a kid so feverish you were really concerned? How many of you ever thought you were going to lose a kid? It's pretty bad, isn't it? It's pretty scary. There's nothing scarier. Our third-born daughter's had 25 major surgeries in her lifetime. Went in a respiratory arrest on Christmas Eve many years ago. She's alive. She's getting married in June. You know what? They told us to abort her. We didn't, of course. You know, she's doing well. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we love our children. The nobleman's no different. The royalty. So as he talked to Jesus, Jesus says, it's done. It was done. And he went home and, wow, about 8 o'clock yesterday morning is when I talked to Jesus. Oh, the fever broke. 16 miles away, this kid is sick and dying. So what happened? Here we got it again. A sign. Sick kid dying. Health kid walking, playing with his Legos now, okay? Jesus was the conduit. Jesus was the doctor. He was the insurance, the copay. He was the one who directed him to get fixed, to be healed, to see the pediatrician, to take care of all the medical stuff. When you think about it, how many here, you might know somebody. I know someone here, but he's retired. But how many here know of somebody you can call right now and will take care of it? They're a physician, an MD. Now, I know a chiropractor. I can go to in a minute. She'll take care of me. You go see Dr. Brooks, she'll fix you, man, let me tell you. I have a dislocated collarbone right now. You think there's an orthopedic surgeon anywhere that'll take a look at me right now? I gotta wait six months. No kidding, I have a dislocated collarbone. I pray about it, but it's kind of like the thorn. I have to deal with it. So I do. But Jesus took this sick kid, made him well. He didn't go to see him, he didn't even do a house call. Didn't even have to go there. He said, go, your son's gonna be fine. Praise God. This is something that is a sign. This is something that, who could do this? Even doctors today, doctors don't do house calls. Now, they have done house calls in the past, but no doctor in their right mind is going to do a house call. Jesus was there. He was being begged. The guy just thought he was a, a healer. He didn't even care. But after that, he saw that this was a Messiah. This was Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. This is so important that you grasp this. So the second one was Jesus is master over distance. Kid was far away. And when you come to realize all that had to take place, if you have a sick kid, you'd have to rush him to the hospital. Then they'd fly him to Cooper or whatever, helicopter. They'd have to do this, get medications, get antibiotics, put him on a cardiac monitor, put him on IV drip, put him on... The, it goes crazy. Jesus wasn't even there. Done. You get the point. Number three, heals a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. One man was there who'd been an invalid for 38 years. We could say 40 years. Uh, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man kind of looked at him, you know. Answered him, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another one steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. Now that day was a Sabbath. Now, 
obviously there's a lot more implications of Pharisees were upset because Jesus had healed someone on the Sabbath. I'm not getting into that today because there's a whole lot of fun there, let me tell you. What I'm trying to get to here is you've got a lame man for 40 years here trying to get into the pool that's steered up supposedly by angels and going to heal him. But he can't get in there because people who can't walk jump in there because their elbow hurts or their head hurts or their neck hurts and they go jumping in ahead of him. you think someone will go and help him once in a while, you know what I mean? No. And Jesus knew who he was. This was predestined. This was known. This is going to happen. So how many here have ever sat on your legs around a campfire? I can't do it anymore. I sit in chairs. My legs all, you know, once my legs fall asleep, it's over. You know what I mean? How many have had to try to get up with your legs just numb and you can't walk? You're like, oh my goodness. Or you have a trick knee, your knee hurts or whatever. Here's a lame guy for 40 years. And here's Jesus, the conduit. He says, take up your bed and walk. The guy gets up, gets his bed, and he gets out of there. Like that. What was Jesus? The conduit? The, Jesus was the, the doctor who diagnosed that he had bad legs. The, he was the guy who took care of the insurance. He was the guy who did the physical therapy. We have physical therapists. I don't know if they're here today, but do you know how long it takes to do physical therapy for a knee or a hip, or a shoulder, or an arm, or eventually a, a dislocated clavicle. It takes a while. But here's a guy who's got no legs. He's got legs, but he's got no nothing. He's, he's crumbled up. Pick up your stuff and walk. Go on. Jesus did that. Jesus fixed all those muscles, did all that physical therapy, gave him the medication to help him with the pain. Now, people said to me in the first place, wait, wait, he didn't give him anything. The point I'm trying to make is that all the things you would have had to have to make him better happened in a minute, right? He was a conduit. He was the son of God. Yes, it's a miracle, but it also points at some very, very important things. All the things. How many here have neck pain? Oh, don't be shy. I'm not going to sue you, Okay. Neck pain. You know what it takes to get rid of neck pain? Dr. Brooke has been working on me forever. I'm getting better and better, but she's been working on me forever. It's just manipulation and working and doing it. Leg pain, you name it. He took them, conduit. Here he is, fixed. It's a process. But when you have the miracle of God happening, pointing to a specific thing here, that's what you have to realize. Jesus is the master over time. The man was that way 38, 40 years, and within a minute, healed. Didn't, he never had to go to physical therapy. He never had to go through insurance. He never had to get a referral to an ortho. He never had to get an MRI. <coughs> Jesus was all that. Amen? Amen? Are you tracking with me? Okay, good. I'm glad you're getting it because I'll repeat it. My wife says, don't repeat it so much. These people, they know what you're saying. They're not mashugana. Okay? <laughs> Number four. Jesus feeds the 5,000. I went through brief verses on this. I'm doing okay on time here. I got a little bit. All right. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said to them to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus was always testing these guys. These guys were not real bright, trust me, okay? Although, he sure loved them. You know what? He just loved them and, and worked with them. Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, I'm sorry, I kind of continued that. Uh, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what they are, not so many. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he gave thanks. To who? Don't be shy. Go ahead, say it. God, yes, yes, he took the loaves. He gave thanks. He distributed them to all those who were seated. Also the fish, as many as they wanted. It was a buffet, fish and chips, you know? Um, and they ate till they were full. That's how I love to eat, till I'm full. That's why I'm in trouble now, okay? 
All right, so, and uh, till nothing was lost, they gathered up all the leftovers. Uh, they gathered them and filled 12 baskets. Everybody had eaten. The point there is Jesus is the bread of life. Here's what I want you to grasp. Let's just pretend for a minute. Now, Joe would probably do this, but if I said, Joe and Mrs. Joe, I got 75 people coming to your house to eat dinner at 2 o'clock. We'll see you there. 2 o'clock, we're on prime rib. Joe would probably have me, you know, a contract out on me, okay? Do you know how hard it is to prepare for something like that? How many have ever had the short notice to have company like that? Not maybe 75 people, but it's not easy. Now, I talked to Eddie before the, the second service, and I said, when we do three to 400 people at a picnic, she says, figure $8 a person, whether it's hot dogs, hamburgers, chips, buns, etc., soda pop. And we had over 400 people at the picnic this last time. Jesus had 5,000 men show up, and you know they had their wives with them, you know, their wives and their kids. So there's probably 15 to 20,000 people there. And Jesus went from a few pieces of bread and fish to having 12 baskets left over of bread. He was the conduit. Track with me. He was the seeds that became the flour and the wheat to make the bread. He was the oven that baked it. He was the baker. He was the one who picked the wheat. You're getting what I, you're tracking with me? Because that all these miracles are something from nothing. And you've got to get that into your heads that these aren't just, oh, yeah, Jesus made water. Wine. Oh, yeah, he walked down water. These are big deals. Something from nothing. Fish. You know what it would cost to take each of you to go to Chick-fil-A or somewhere where there's fish and maybe some bread? Probably seven or eight bucks to feed each one of you. If we went to a buffet, probably 10 bucks. And what do we have? Probably 100 or 120 people here. That adds up. Take it to 5,000 to 15,000. You get the point of how important this is? You're getting all this because I want you to realize that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it was a sign. It wasn't just a miracle. It was a sign that was a miracle. And not all miracles are signs, Okay. This point is something deeper, much deeper. Jesus is the bread of life. Number five, walks on water, still the storm. I went to Mark for this because I like it. it was more dramatic, okay? But it's basically the same thing, okay? On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. The other boats were with them. They were following because they wanted to be more of this. They wanted to see more food and more miracles and all this fun stuff. <coughs> and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. He was with them in the stern asleep on a cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care if we are perishing? We're dying here. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea. Peace, be still. And the wind stopped. And there was great calm. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? They all were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Here's a point I want to make. I used to be a rescue scuba diver in the fire department in Chicago. We were like the, the local Coast Guard, although we weren't Coast Guard. Coast Guard only does surface rescue when they go to help. We did scuba rescue. We went under the water with tanks 50, 60 feet down, however it was. And I remember going out 2 o'clock in the morning one night for a yacht that was on fire. It was completely involved. People were bailing off the yacht, jumping into the water. We're plucking them out and get them into the helicopter and getting them out of there. Couldn't get a boat out there because the seas were way too rough. Let me tell you, when you're, when you're a rescue scuba diver and you're floating on the surface and the water is going like this and like this and it's cold and you're being tossed around, it's real easy to get nauseous, dizzy, and I'm a guy who used to fly. I'm a pilot. I've done more scuba diving and stuff like that, but when you're out there rescuing people, now I'm trying to save lives here. I'm going out there and doing this, and I'm trying to figure out who am I going to help? Who's next? Is there any babies out there? Is there any children with life preservers on? <coughs> very, very emotional, very stirring, very scary. I was scared when I went out there. I wasn't this big hero-saving guy. I was scared for my life, but I know where I'm going. I know if I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm not worried about that part. I want to save your kid. I want to save you. Got out there, took care of business, and I understand what it's like to be scared, to be in a boat like that, to be out at sea or out in the lake. Very scary. 
And Jesus said to the storm as it's raining and swirling and the boat is tossing and turning, he says, be still. <whistles> Calm, gentle. Now, I can't really put that in any kind of human factor because I don't know anybody that can still a storm. I don't know anybody who can tell you. When I went to these scenes, I would grab a senior citizen or somebody and say, I got you. I've got you. I have you. I'm not letting you go. And we'd hoist them up into the helicopter and rescue these folks or families or kids. I can give them that comfort, but I can't sit there and go, be calm. I couldn't do that. I didn't have that ability. But I can pluck them out of the calm. Christ took this horrible storm and stilled it. Amen? Amen. That's the miracle there. That's what you have to grasp. You can't touch those elements. They will get you. Let me tell you, he took that and calmed it. That, my friends, is the Son of God. Amen? Amen. Okay. Jesus, master over nature. That's what that was. He is the master over nature. I got two more. I'll go quick here. Number six, Jesus heals the blind man from birth. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground, made mud with his saliva, then anointed the man's eyes with the mud. Gave him a little mud cake on his eyes, okay? Said to him, go, wash in the pool of Shalom, which meant scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. So Jesus heals the blind man from birth. Jesus is the light of the world. Here's a man who's blind from birth. Blind, can't see. The symbolism there is they don't see he is the Messiah. Most people will say, oh, I'll go to your church. But you know what? They get the message. They get the truth. They get the gospel, but they don't see it. And that's the problem that happens. We all want to be spiritual. But you got to see it and grab it and love it. Amen? Amen? The blind man, here he is. Now he sees. Oh, I could go to, didn't see an eye doctor, didn't get an eye surgeon, didn't get laser surgery, blah, blah, blah. I can go through all that nonsense. But Jesus was the conduit. He did all that. Boom, he can see now. Praise God. Anybody ever been temporarily blind here? Anybody? Oh, it's, it's scary. Let me tell you, it is scary. Go black. Cover your eyes. Do it for two days. Try it. I don't care if you have to work for a living. Tell them you're doing an experiment. <laughs> yeah, boy. Please don't. I'm just teasing you. You get the idea. If you can't see, there's nothing more miserable. Nothing. I, I, I went deaf. My ears were full of stuff, and I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't stand it because I couldn't talk. My wife said that was the best week of her life. <laughs> Jesus, the light of the world. Number seven. Let's close out with this one. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Let's go quickly here. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came there with, were also weeping, he was deeply moved, and the spirit greatly troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Jesus didn't go, oh, <laughs> Lazarus. Jesus cried like a baby. He was wailing. You know, you lose someone you love, you're going to cry. I've done it. When my dad died, I was a mess. I was bawling. The casket there, my dad, the man who raised me, taught me to pray, taught me to love, taught me to be the man that I am today, is gone. Now I have to be a man without him. You think that's easy? It's not. I love calling my dad and telling him what I did today. How many guys feel that way, huh? Amen. It's nothing like having a dad. But I've got a heavenly dad, amen? amen. So Jesus cried. He was hurting. So you said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not be the opening eyes of the blind? He could have kept this man from dying? Sure. That wasn't the purpose here. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time it'll stink. It's awful. It's been there dead for four days. Trust me, folks. There's nothing worse than a dead corpse. There's just nothing worse. It's, it's, it, after it starts to decompose, the smell makes me so sick I get headaches. Let me tell you. Take away the stone. 
they did. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see in glory of God? You would see the glory of God. Tell me, say that to me. You will see the glory of God. Took away the stone. Jesus lifted his eyes and said, Father, thank you. You heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe you sent me. He said these words, and he said, Lazarus, come out. Out came Lazarus. Death, life. Jesus was the conduit. Fix it. Amen? Amen. So last thing I want to tell you is Gospel of John 20, 30, and 31. This is why these verses are here. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and they believing life in his name. Let's close. Father, thank you. Thank you for showing us how Jesus did these signs and these miracles. May they go home, work on their spiritual walk, and grow in your precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.